He came within a hair of the 2016 Democratic nomination. Whoa! This time, Senator Bernie Sanders says he's going all the way. What's going to be different this time? We're going to win. With the party moving left, the independent Democratic Socialist from Vermont reminds voters he's the original. Three years ago, during our 2016 campaign, we were told that our ideas were radical and they were extreme. And in the shadow of this once iconic steel plant, Senator Bernie Sanders talks the economy, jobs, and his vision for the future of America. steel plant, plant blasts those furnaces and they produce thousands of tons of steel a day. That steel built skyscrapers and helped the U.S. win two world wars. The plant closed in 1995, really devastating this working class community. But now there is a new day dawning in Bethlehem economically and politically here in Northampton country, which Northampton County, which is where we are. Uh, they voted for President Barack Obama in big numbers and for the Democrat all the way back to Bush 41, actually. But it flipped the script in this county and they voted for Donald Trump in 2016 by a shift of nine points. And that's one of the reasons we are here. Senator Sanders is hoping to get those voters back in the blue column. According to all recent polls, he's leading among declared Democrat candidates. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Awesome. Senator, we want to start. Uh, we're going to get a lot of questions from the audience. Martha and I will follow up throughout. Let's start by getting right to our audience. Our first question is from Joe. He is a student from Allentown, PA. Joe, what's your question? Hey, Joe. Hi, Senator Sanders. Uh, now that your tax returns have been released and you have been identified as a millionaire and in the top 1%, will you pay your fair share? And how do you plan to apply the policies that you have been talking about and forcing on top earners? Thank you, Senator Sanders. Well, uh, I happen to believe, Joe, that we have an absurd tax system. And while millions of people today are paying actually more in taxes than they anticipated, Amazon, Netflix, and dozens of major corporations as a result of Trump's tax bill pay nothing in federal taxes. I think that's a disgrace. So today we announced... <laughs> now, you raised the issue, I am a millionaire. Well, actually, this year we had $560,000 in income. And that's a lot of money. And that money, in my case, my wife's case, it came from a book that I wrote. Pretty good book. You might want to read it. <laughs> it was a bestseller. It sold all over the world, and we made money. So if anyone thinks that I should apologize for writing a best-selling book, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but let me reiterate. I voted against. I guess on Fox News, you said that I benefited from... Trump's tax bill? Did you tell people that I voted against Trump's tax bill? Sure, but you, okay. did, you did benefit you did from it. Yeah. <laughs> but I voted against it. And I happen to believe that a tax bill written and pushed by Trump, who told the American people that that tax bill, some of you may recall, would not benefit the wealthy. You remember that? Yeah. Oh, it's not going bet to benefit the wealthy. 83% of the benefits went to the top. 1%. So I think that's a bad idea. And in my view, people, whether it's me, you, you probably make a lot more money than I do. <laughs> but whether it's me or you or anybody else, I think wealthy people and large corporations that are making billions of profits should start paying their fair share of taxes. But Senator, to, to your point, and to Joe's point, your taxes do show 
that you're a millionaire. You did make a million in 2016, 2017. You're right, the 561 in 2018. But your marginal tax rate, tax rate was 26% because of President yeah. Trump's tax cuts. So why not say, you know, I'm leading this revolution. I'm not going to take those. <laughs> Come on. But there he... I am... I paid the taxes that I owe. And by the way, why don't you got Donald Trump up here and ask him how much he pays in taxes? Yeah, well, yeah, well, well, I am eagerly awaiting your doing that. Well, we'd love to have you. We would love we'll, to have you. Well, get him up here. And if the president, I guess the president watches your network a little bit, right? <laughs> hey, President Trump, my wife and I just released 10 years. Please do the same. Let the American people know how much we owe. All right. But just, just to wrap that up. You do spend a lot of time vilifying millionaires. No, I don't vilify. The fact that I think people who are doing phenomenally well right now, as you know, for 40 years we have seen a shrinking middle class. You've got 40 million people living in poverty. And today, it just so happens that the very wealthy are doing incredibly wealthy. It's not vilifying to say that people who have a whole lot of money, in some cases billions of dollars of wealth, they should pay their fair share of taxes. Right. Well, Brett, a lot that's of, not vilified. On the yeah. Last question on this. The, a lot of millionaires and billionaires give a ton to charity. You gave 3.4%. Yeah. My wife and I do give money to charity. All right? And we're proud to do what we did. There are others. You're quite right. There are people. Gates Foundation do a phenomenal job. We do what we do. All right. I got a couple questions for you. So you, you recommended a, a wealth tax, 70% wealth tax. No, actually, I didn't. That was 70, somebody 77%. Else. No, I think another person. What would, what's your number? What's my number? Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think that in order to make sure that elderly people do not continue to live in poverty, and you got 20% of elderly people trying to get by up thirteen dollars or $14,000 a year, I think we should raise that cap for people making $250,000 or more so we can make sure that our parents can live out their lives in dignity. I'll tell you what else I think. I think at a time when Wall Street is doing phenomenally well and we have millions of young people who are deeply in debt for the crime of having gone to college, I believe we should pass a speculation tax on Wall Street. Well, that, that's fine, Street. but I'm asking you about the wealthy and how much higher you would make it. You said yeah, you, I, you I don't agree with 70%. What would your number be? In the campaign in 2016, we talked about 52%. All right, so 52%. So would you be willing to pay 52% on the money that you made? Oh, so you can volunteer. You can send a check. Well, you can volunteer, too. We have a... But you suggested, have, you suggested that uh, that's hey, what uh, everybody in your brain do. And Martha, why don't you give? You make more money than I well, do. Why I don't you give? I didn't give? suggest a wealth tax. And she's not running for president. And All right, but we're going to fight for a wealth tax. And we're going to demand that we end the absurdity where major corporation after major corporation. You know what? Yeah, in this, tax bill, in this right tax bill that you are defending, families defending like the Koch brothers, of course you're defending it. You families propose. like the Koch brothers get billions and billions of dollars in savings. That is absurd. Trump wants to repeal the entire estate tax. Huge tax breaks for billionaires. You got another question? Well, we have about? many questions. We have many though. questions. And listen, it, we want to get substance. We want to get details. Well, let's do it. And the audience has a ton of questions, too. All right. Martha? So our, our question comes from Kathy Harrington. Kathy, what's your question Hi. for Senator Sanders? Hi, Senator Sanders. Welcome to the Lehigh Valley. So my question is, the definition of socialism is just a society agreeing to work together and combining their resources to make sure everyone is protected and taken care of. How can you challenge the idea that socialism is bad in the minds well, of the public? You might have asked them, not me. <laughs> but is this going to be a constant thing? No. It, <laughs> I mean, let, no, it will not. All right. All right. You ask me fair questions, I will give you fair answers. Thank you, sir. That's the deal. And you know, not everybody thought that I should come on this show. And we appreciate it. All right. Your network does not necessarily have a great deal of respect in my world, but I thought it was important for me to be here and have a serious discussion about serious issues. Sally asked a good question. Thanks for that question, Sally. And let's, let's talk about it. And I, I think it's an important issue, but it will come up. What is democratic socialism? Fair question? Okay. So let's talk about it. 
Democratic socialism, to me, is creating a government and an economy and a society which works for all rather than just the top 1%. It means ending the absurd inequalities that exist today. And I want to lay this out because you're not going to hear this much on Fox and you're not going to hear this much in the media in general. And the American people have got to conclude whether we think it is appropriate and what America is about to have three families owning more wealth than the bottom half of the American society, 160 million people, whether it's appropriate for the top 1% to own more wealth than the bottom 92%, whether it is right that 49% of all new income goes to the top 1% when many people, Brett and Martha, who are watching this program, are working two or three jobs just to pay the bills. So first of all, we want to create a government that works for all of us, and we want to create a political system in, which is based on one person, one vote, not billionaires buying elections as a result of this disastrous Citizens United <laughs> Supreme Court decision. And furthermore, furthermore, when I talk, and you know, people have different views of capitalism or democratic socialism, whatever it may be, but this is my view. I believe that human beings, especially in a wealthy, democratic, civilized society like our own, are entitled to certain basic rights. So let me be very clear, and I'm sure we'll discuss it later in the show, Brett. I believe that health care is a human right, not a privilege. Okay? And I believe, I believe that there is something embarrassingly wrong when the United States of America is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people. I live 50 we're, miles from the Canadian border. We're going to get in okay. detail about Medicare. Right. And so health care is right. I believe that education, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, you have the right to get all of the education you need. And that is why I believe we should make public colleges and universities tuition free. We're going to talk about all of this. Good. And we're going to try to talk about how you pay for it, which That's is a real question. Absolutely. But I just want to back on the, the taxes briefly. You know, when you wrote, wrote the book and you made the money, yeah. isn't that the definition of capitalism, the American dream? No. <laughs> I mean, you know. What we want is a country where everybody has opportunity. You know, I have a college degree. Look, I'm a United States senator. But a lot of people don't have a college degree. A lot of people are not United States senators. I want everybody in this country to be able to have health care, to have education, to when they turn on the water, have dr drinkable water, not toxic water. So what we are fighting for, Brett, is, is a society not where just a few people can make a whole lot of money, but a society where everybody in this country has the opportunity to live in security uh, and dignity. All right. So uh, this weekend, I'm going to talk a little bit about the field of Democratic candidates who are out there. This weekend, Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, announced that he is also a candidate for the Democratic nomination. Uh, he's running, and, and here's what he said in South Bend. A moment like that calls for hopeful and audacious voices from communities like ours. And yes, it calls for a new generation of leadership in this country. So Buttigieg obviously is the, the youngest candidate. He would certainly be the youngest uh, president if he were to win 37. at 37 years old. And you are 77 years old, sir. He's calling for a new generation. Um, he didn't name anyone specifically. But what do you say to those who have raised the question of whether or not you are, would be too old at 79 as president? Well, follow me around the campaign trail. <laughs> yeah. Martha, I mean, it is a fair question. It's a fair question. And all I can say is if there was wood here, I'd knock on it. Thank God my health is good. I was, when I was a kid, I was a long-distance runner, one of the better milers in New York City. Uh, and I've continued to have my endurance. But I think when you look at a candidate, yeah, you could look at age, that's fair. You could look at experience. I was a mayor for eight years, know a little bit about local government. I was a member of the House. I'm a member of the United States Senate. I've been all over the world talking to heads of state. So, I mean, I think it is a combination of factors. But at the end of the day, this is what I honestly believe. 
It's not whether you're young. It's not whether you're old. It is what you believe in. And I have to say, and I have to say, and this is, this is not a criticism of, of Fox. This is a criticism of media in general. There is too much focus on individuals and not enough focus on the American people and what their needs are. And I want to tell you this, and again, this is not just Fox. This is all the rest. I go out and I listen to the people and they say, give me, they ask me questions. Those questions are often very, very different than the issues being discussed by Meteor on Capitol Hill. Okay? So. All right, Senator, we want to get back to audience questions. I, I do want to say that we understand and we're very grateful that you're here. We are giving you an hour of substance and talk on our airwaves so we can get over the Fox thing, if, if, if you're all right with that. Okay. Brian is a city councilman here in Bethlehem. Brian, what's your question? Go ahead, Brian. Hold on one second. Brian's got the floor. Senator Sanders, as a... Uh, Where's Brian? Okay. A, and as a member of Bethlehem City Council, welcome to Christmas City. Thank you. My, my question is, as a lifetime Kennedy uh, Democrat, more specifically center left, uh, my concern is that President Trump has so inflamed our, uh, the Democratic base that we will shift too far left and overreach like the Republicans did with the Tea Party in 2010. What are your thoughts on that? Good question. And look, this is what I say every day. Um, I disagree uh, with Donald Trump on virtually every issue, and I talk about it. And I'll tell you what upsets me, but I'll tell you what upsets me the most, and I'm gonna answer your question, is that um, whether you're conservative or moderate, or progressive. I don't think the American people are proud uh, that we have a president who is a pathological liar. And I was just, and I say that, you know, it does not give me pleasure to say that, all right? I disagreed with George W. Bush on almost everything. Bush was not a pathological liar. Trump cannot even tell the truth, even as to where his father was born. It's really that crazy. His father was born in New York. He claims he was born in Germany. But if you can't even tell the truth about where your father was born, it's hard to believe anything that he says. But to answer your question, look, if we spend all of our time attacking Trump, you know what? Democrats are going to lose. All right? So our, job, our job is to lay out a vision that makes sense to the working families of this country. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Over a four-year period, and the uh, video that you showed earlier, I think, captured that, uh, we raised issues four years ago, which were thought to be extreme and a little bit out there, but today they're accepted by the American people. So I think you talk to the people of Bethlehem and Burlington, Vermont, you say, what's on your mind? Well, you know what? Among other things, if you work 40 hours a week, people don't want to live in poverty. We've got to raise that minimum wage to a living wage. Yeah. In my state of Vermont and all over this country, we've got an infrastructure that is falling about roads and bridges and water systems, wastewater. But we can put 15 million people back to work with a trillion dollar investment. Think that makes sense to people? So I agree with you, all right? I mean, I think Trump is a dangerous president, but if all we do is focus on him, we lose. Our job is to develop an agenda that speaks to the needs of workers. When we do that, we're going to win, and win big. Senator, it, it looks like, nobody knows for sure, but it looks like Vice President Joe Biden is likely to get into the race. Are you worried that the DNC, if that, you know, he would be a strong establishment candidate, he's obviously been around for a long time, are you worried that the DNC might put its finger on the scale again the way that they did to you back in 2016 with Hillary Clinton? Well, you're right. We went through that in 2016. Yeah. And I think we have come a long way since then. So we, uh, we speak to the DNC uh, every week. Uh, and I think the process uh, will be fair. Uh, one of the important changes that we made, uh, and we won, is as you will recall, both of you recall me, in the last time around, the 2016, Secretary Clinton had 500 superdelegates lined up behind her before the first vote was cast in Iowa. And that seemed to me pretty dumb and unfair. Well, that process has been changed. And I think that works well for everybody. But let me ask you just because now the 
process is that in the next round, the no. superdelegates would come into play. And with so many candidates on the Democratic side, it's possible that somebody doesn't get 50%. Yep. Yep. Are you concerned about it? Are you talking to the DNC about that? Could well, that that's the, what the rule is. I yeah. mean, that's where we are right now. But you're right. Uh, I mean, I would hope that the Democratic Party understands what they did some years ago. And that is what we want to hear from is not political insiders and campaign contributors. You want to hear from ordinary people in Iowa and Pennsylvania, and they should determine who the next Democratic nominee will be. Okay, let's go to another question. Jordan is a student from Scotch Plains. Uh, he has the next question. Hi, Senator. Thank you so much for being here. My question is, why do you believe that the government can provide better health care than the private sector, and why should people who like their plans be forced to switch? Okay. Um, first of all, let's be clear what we mean by Medicare for all, okay? Medicare is a government-run program for seniors, which is widely popular and quite effective. Uh, in 1965, when Lyndon Johnson passed that bill, it was called by some Republicans, socialism and everything else. But you go to the average senior and you say, how do you feel about Medicare? And they will tell you that they will oppose any Republican effort to cut Medicare. And by the way, in Trump's budget, he has proposed an $845 billion cut over a 10-year period to Medicare, which seniors don't want. So to answer your question, we are not talking about government-run health care. The Veterans Administration, and most veterans think that that's a pretty good health care system, talk to the American Legion and the VFW. They strongly defend the uh, veterans' uh, health care. That's government run. What we are talking about is simply a single payer insurance program, which means that you will have a card which has Medicare on it. You'll go to any doctor that you want. You'll go to any hospital that you want. And by the way, millions of people today are in networks which prevent them from doing this. So this gives you freedom of choice with regard to the doctors you go to or the hospitals you go to. But here is the main point when we talk about health care. Currently, right now, we got 30 million people, zero health insurance, and many of you and tens of millions of Americans are underinsured with high deductibles and copayments. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So what happens is there are estimates that some 30,000 Americans die every single year because they don't go to the doctor when they should. All right. Meanwhile, we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. One out of five Americans are getting ripped off by the drug companies who make billions in profits while charging us the highest prices in the world. And on top of all of that, we spend twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other nation. So the question that I throw back to you, do you think it makes sense to spend twice as much per capita as the people of any other nation? and be the only country on, in the world not to guarantee health care to all people. Um, this, audience, this audience has a lot of Democrats in it. It has uh, Republicans, independents, Democratic socialists, conservatives. Uh, I want to ask the audience a question, if you could raise your hand here. A show of hands of how many people get their insurance from work, private insurance, right now. How many get it from private insurance? Okay, now of those, how many are willing to transition to what the senator says, a government-run system? There's 180 million people on private insurance. All right, let's deal with that, Brett. And Fair they, question. they Brett. would be lost, right? Oh, Brett. To a, your Brett. system. Fair okay. question. Okay. Good question. Good, thank and you. And I know it's what the right wing throws out, so let me answer it, all right? <laughs> Millions of people every single year lose their health insurance. You know why? They get fired or they quit and they go to another employer. I was the mayor for eight years. You know what I did, what probably every mayor in America does, is you look around for the best insurance program, the most cost-effective insurance. You change insurance. Every year, millions of workers wake up in the morning and their employer has changed the insurance that they have. Maybe they like the doctors. People are nodding their heads, okay? So this is not new every year. Now, what we are talking about, actually, is stability that when you have a Medicare for all, it is there now and will be there in the future. Senator, Senator, let me ask you a question about, about Vermont, because Vermont tried to have a 
single-payer program. And in 2014, the Democratic governor abandoned it because he had to raise income taxes, had to raise uh, payroll taxes, and the people of Vermont didn't want their taxes no, to go up. No, it's not quite true. And, that, and, it, and they abandoned no, the program. You, so if well, you're getting in Vermont, into internal Vermont politics, of which I know a little bit. Well, I'm sure so you I do. I don't want to be here. Yeah. So it, All right, it, the governor did a rather poor job. But I think if you look at polling, especially among Democrats, as I'm sure you have, you tell me strong majority of Democrats and more than a few Republicans want to see a Medicare for all program. What the opponents, and let's be clear about this, Martha. When you are dealing with an health care, which is, what's it, 18% of our GDP? I mean, we're talking about three and a half trillion dollars a year. Yes. And you have insurance companies that make billions and billions of dollars in profit. Let me give you an example, if I might, of the dysfunctionality of the current health care system. Recently, um, Aetna merged with CVS, you may recall that, big merger, which in my view will drive health care costs up. The gentleman who was head of uh, Aetna's, a name Mr. Bertolini, you know what he got for putting together that merger? He got a $500 million bonus. Do you think that's how we should spend health care no, dollars? I mean, I think everybody is in agreement that health care needs to be fixed in this country. The question is how. And my question to you was it, it will drive up taxes to pay for health care. And not just the wealthy will pay for that. The middle class Good. will also okay. pay for Very it. Very good. So how do you justify it? And All right, Martha, what are you not including in your discussion? You tell me. I will tell you. You're not going to pay any health insurance premiums. <laughs> But look, You're Martha, say one way or the other. Martha. Whether it's in your income oh, tax or your payroll tax, you're right. Look, health care is not free. You never heard me suggest that we're going to match You just said it was going to be free for everyone. It's going to be free at the point of when you use it. Okay? And you go to. Why are you so shocked by this? Because someone's going to pay. Goes, somebody is going <laughs> to pay. Who are they? Who okay. Pays? Okay. One minute. One second. Okay. Relax. I'm just asking. We'll be talking. Please. We'll get through this it's together. It's a common question. Okay. We had, okay. The, All right. we had we so many email questions. Okay. Ask Senator Sanders how he is fair going enough. to pay. Fair enough. I got it. It's a fair but question. But the first thing, let's just say hypothetically. Okay. You're, uh, you are um, self-employed and you have, you've got a husband and two kids. Okay? Family of four. Do you know how much that family is paying today for health care? Tell me. $28,000 a year. Okay. All right, we're spending $11,000 per person. We are saying to that family of four, you ain't going to pay that $28,000. You're not paying any more premiums. You're not paying any more co-payments. You're not paying any more deductibles. How's that? $28,000 you're not paying. But does that mean you're not going to pay something? Of course it does. You're going to pay more in taxes. And do members of Congress who right. now have gold-plated health insurance... No, we don't. Well, they have a special plan that's outside Obamacare. Uh, mm. A different plan. You know, do member of, members of Congress, are they going to do that transition as Damn well? Damn right. Of course. Of course. Why would you suggest otherwise? But I, I want to make the point. I want to get back to the point that Martha raised. Look, health care costs money. Every other country, or virtually every country, does it in the same way we do education for our kids. Okay, when a kid walks into school, Kid doesn't have to take out a credit card, right? It's paid for out of public funds. That's what most countries do. So if you're asking me, if your question is a fair question, are people going to pay more in taxes? Yes. But at the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of people are going to end up paying less for health care because they're not paying premiums, co-payments, and deductibles. We're going to get into many more specifics. Senator, thank you.